This is Story Recapped. Today, I'm going to explain a crime, drama, and fantasy film called Perfume, The Story of a Murderer. Based on the book written by German writer Patrick Suskind, this film depicts a gut-wrenching tale about greed, ambition, obsession, and murder. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. Many people are driven by ambition. This is what fuels us throughout our lives and what constitutes our happiness. However, ambitions can easily take over and corrupt our intentions, turning them into greed. When do we draw the line between ambition and obsession? What happens when we finally achieve our heart's desire? Will this guarantee us everlasting love and happiness? The film poses these questions as it takes us to 18th century France. Several guards drag a bound man named Jean-Baptiste Granouy and present him to an enraged mob. As his death sentence is announced, Granouy faces the crowd and recalls the previous events that led to his impending doom. It all starts in a repugnant market in Paris. A peasant woman, attending to her stall, drops to the ground and gives birth to Granouy. Having had four stilpers before him, she cuts the cord and pushes him into the leftover fish guts, assuming that he's dead. As Granouy takes his first breaths, he smells everything around him, from the vomit on the floor up to the maggots feasting inside a dead rat. It turns out that Granouy is gifted with an unnerving sense of smell. As he lets out his first cry, he alerts the people in the market. Suddenly, someone accuses his mother of killing him. Fearing for her life, the peasant woman tries to run away, but is soon caught and sent to the gallows. Granouy is born into the world unwanted, with his first sign of rejection coming from his very own mother. In the book, it is actually revealed that he is born without his own scent. Based on the film's philosophy, which states that the scent is the soul of beings, having no scent means having no identity at all. This may also explain his mother's innate rejection of him. No matter the reason, this rejection and the lack of scent start Granouy's isolated life. His mother's death also signals the inevitable doom that would soon cross every person who comes into his life. Granouy is quickly sent to Madame Gaillard's orphanage. The children are disturbed by him, and so, they try to suffocate him. Madame Gaillard hears the baby crying and whips the children. Once again, Granouy's cries save his life. By the time he turns 13, Madame Gaillard sells Granouy as an apprentice to a man named Grimal, who owns a tannery. She takes the money and leaves. On her way home, two men rob Madame Gaillard and slit her throat. Life expectancy in the tannery is five years, but Granouy proves himself to be a valuable worker to Grimal. As he works in the tannery, he soon discovers a place of unexplored sense across the river in the city streets of Paris. In this scene, we come to an understanding that when people do interact with Granouy, it is always in the form of greed. Madame Gaillard feeds him and puts a roof above his head, but she doesn't do this because she genuinely cares for him, but rather she sees him as a form of investment. The state pays her to take care of these orphan children, and the more orphans she has, the more money she will receive. Hence, why she struck the children for trying to suffocate him. She doesn't want to lose an investment. When Granouy grows up and proves to be a liability, she discards him by literally selling him to Grimal. This treatment of Granouy will form his view on relationships. As we will see in later scenes, greed will also become a recurring theme in his life. Madame Gaillard also falls into her inevitable doom, much like Granouy's mother. Several years pass by, and Granouy's day of triumph soon arrives when Grimal takes him to make a delivery in the city. As Granouy walks the busy streets, he takes in every possible scent that his lungs can inhale. With his ability, Granouy is able to dissect these scents, even breaking them down to their bare ingredients. As they're making their delivery, Granouy catches a very pleasant scent that he has never smelled before. He follows his nose and finds himself outside Pelissier's shop, Paris's most famous perfumer. He watches as Pelissier introduces his latest creation to his customers, a perfume called Amour and Psyche. This scene captures Granouy's first exposure to a world of scents he has never experienced before. He quickly learns that scents do not act alone and are usually a combination of two or more other scents. His ability to dissect scents will prove to be useful in aiding his ambition. This discovery makes his character greedy and fuels his desire to capture all the smells the world has to offer. To Granouy, it doesn't matter if these smells are good or bad, he wants them all. The scene in front of Policier's shop is also an important one because it's in this instance that Granouy is introduced to the possibility of storing scent, an idea that he has never thought of before, hence his entranced face. Suddenly, Granouy catches another scent. It is the sweetest scent he's ever smelled in his life. He manages to track down the scent of a red-haired woman selling plums. He follows her around until she notices him. He grabs her hand and starts smelling it intensely. Feeling scared by his manic behavior, the woman runs away. Granouy tracks the scent in the air and quickly finds the woman again. This time, she is alone as she cuts open the plums. He sneaks behind her and smells her until she turns around and gasps. Granouy clasps her mouth just in time before anyone hears them. 
His strong grasp suffocates her, and she eventually dies. Gronwy tears open her clothes as he scoops out her scent to inhale them. Unfortunately, as her body decomposes, the scent starts to disappear. Gronwy's heart breaks as soon as he realizes this. This is one of the most important scenes in the film. The woman's death makes him realize that scents have a temporary shelf life. When the person bearing that scent dies, so does the scent. Gronwy feels devastated when he finds out that he cannot bottle the woman's scent, just like the perfumes he smelt a while ago in Policier's shop. This encounter fuels Gronwy's lifelong ambition to preserve the scent. Meanwhile, one celebrated Italian perfumer, Giuseppe Baldini, sits in his empty shop. His assistant, Chenier, offers him a sample of a Morin Psyche to help Baldini in his current commission. Baldini acts offended and retreats to his study to work. In truth, Baldini has already purchased a sample and has been trying for days to figure out the formula. He did countless tests and was able to identify the first two ingredients, lime oil and orange blossom. But no matter how much he tried, he couldn't figure out the third one. Later that night, Baldini opens his door to Granui, who has arrived with his order of goat skins. Baldini takes Granui to his laboratory, where he keeps all his ingredients and creates his perfumes. Granui then makes a bold move by declaring that he has the best nose in Paris, and even dares to recreate the Amoran Psyche perfume for him. Wanting to teach Granui a lesson in humility, Baldini agrees to entertain him. Baldini watches in awe as Granui confidently mixes a number of essential oils, enough to fill a tiny flask. When he tests the sample, he turns to Granui and declares that it is a perfect replica of Policier's perfume. Granui claims that he can make the perfume better and mixes in a couple more ingredients. Baldini's pride is hurt and he orders the young man to leave. Granui begs the perfumer to teach him how to preserve smell. Baldini tells him that he'll think about it. Now that he's alone, Baldini takes a sniff of Granui's perfume and is instantly transported into his own kind of heaven. Granui's perfume is perfect beyond words. In this scene, we see the parallels between Granui and Baldini's characters. They're both passionate about the world of sense, are very ambitious, and have huge egos. However, there's also a huge contrast to their characters. Granui is without a doubt extremely talented, but he has no knowledge of the technicalities of manipulating, storing, and creating original sense. For Baldini, whatever he lacks in talent, he makes up with his years of experience and hard work. But no matter what he does, he doesn't have the same ingenuity as someone like Granui. This comparison will help us set the first impression on their relationship in the upcoming scenes. The very next day, Baldini heads over to the tannery and offers Grimal 50 francs for Granui. Grimal, who thinks the old man has gone over his head, laughs as he accepts the money. Unfortunately for Grimal, his fortune doesn't last long. Later that night, he gets drunk and hits his head, falling into a nearby river and ending his miserable life. On the other hand, Granui starts out as Baldini's apprentice. He creates a perfume for Baldini that quickly outsells his rivals and shoots him to stardom, even surpassing his former glory. In turn, Baldini teaches Granui about the perfumer's craft. Just like a musical chord, a perfume chord contains four essences, or notes, which are carefully selected for their harmonic affinity. Each perfume contains three chords, the head, the heart, and the bass, necessitating 12 notes in all. The head chord is the perfume's first impression, and usually lasts only a few minutes. The heart chord is the theme of the perfume, and can last for several hours. Finally, the bass chord is the tail of the perfume that can last up to several days. Baldini adds that to create a truly original perfume. One has to add a thirteenth essence, or note, that will dominate all the others. Granui strikes a deal with the perfumer. If he teaches him how to preserve all scents, then Granui will make him the best perfumer in the world. The ambitious perfumer agrees to his deal. Here, we see the recurring theme of greed in Granui's relationships. Much like Madame Gaillard, Grimal disposed of him when he learned that he could profit off of his existence. And just like Madame Gaillard, Grimal is quickly sent to his death just as soon as Granui leaves his life. Despite being free from a laborious life, Granui is just transferred to another greedy master in the form of Baldini. Baldini is no fool, and he knows that Granui is worth much more than what he paid for. He has no second thoughts of taking advantage of Granui as much as he can. The fact that Granui has no interest in money only adds to his greedy and exploitive nature. On the other hand, Granui doesn't care much for anything other than his sole ambition, learn how to preserve the scent. When Baldini teaches him the three chords that make up perfume, this creates the perfect vessel to carry out his future plans. What Baldini doesn't know, however, is that Granui has a different essence in mind. The following day, Baldini teaches Granui how to extract an essence by boiling 10,000 roses at the right temperature until its oil condenses and drops into a tiny flask. He also tells Granui about a town called Grass, the land of perfumers. No one can call himself a true perfumer until he has proved himself in Grass. This story frees Granui's ambition, and so he sets out to experiment by himself. The very next morning, Baldini wakes up to a frantic Granui in his laboratory. It turns out that Granui had tried to extract the sense of iron glass, and copper. He even tried boiling Baldini's cat. This horrifies Baldini and tells him that Granui can't extract the essence of an animal, much less a human being. This revelation shocks Granui so much that he faints 
and quickly falls ill. When Baldini told him that he would teach him to preserve all sense, Granui took this in the literal sense. This miscommunication creates a ripple in their relationship. Baldini doesn't understand why Granui wants to distill the scent of iron and copper, but this is only because he is limited by the ability of his own nose. We see here how important it is for Granui to fulfill his ambition. The fact that he went as far as boiling Baldini's cat proves that he doesn't see limitations when it comes to serving his purpose. This is a turning point in Granui because we can see that his ambition is slowly turning into an obsession. Baldini is devastated and does everything to help Granui recover. As Granui lays on his deathbed, he asks his master if there's any way to extract an essence besides distilling it. Baldini then tells him about the art of enflorage, but he can only learn it in grass. This information revives Granui and within a week, he is well again. He decides to travel to grass, but in order to do that, he needs journey papers. Baldini agrees to give the papers as long as Granui gives him no less than 100 formulas for perfumes. Granui doesn't care, and he could have given Baldini a thousand formulas if he wanted to. Once he acquires his paper, Granui sets foot for grass. On the night of Granui's departure, Baldini lays on his bed with his formulas and goes to sleep with a smile on his face. Unfortunately, his house crumbles down before he sees the next sunrise, ending the life of the once celebrated perfumer Baldini. Much like those who came before him, Baldini is no exception when it comes to his greediness. He helped Granui recover because he doesn't want to lose the secret to his success. Baldini knows that he is nothing without Granui, so before he even agrees to set him free, he demands more than a hundred formulas from him. Baldini's self-interest, just like Granui's ambition, knows no limit. But just like those who came before him, Baldini also suffered the same unfortunate demise. It's as if Granui's departure was a bad omen. On his way to grass, Granui takes a detour and explores the mountains. The clean, clear, and pure air draws him in, and he soon finds a cave that is almost deprived of scent. As he sits inside the crevice, Granui can only smell the tranquil scent of dead stone around him. No longer distracted by external scents, he can finally bask in his own existence. Granui stays in the cave for several years, and he could have stayed there even longer until the woman with the plums began to haunt him in his dreams again. This time, he finds himself behind her as he takes in her scent. But when she turns around, she acts as if she can't even see him. Granui wakes up to a horrific realization. He can smell everything around him, except for himself. He finally realizes that he has no scent of his own. All his life, he has been a nobody to everyone. Without his scent, it's as if he never existed. Granui gets out of the cave and finally makes his way to grass. This time, he has a new plan. He will make sure that everyone in grass will know his name and know that he is exceptional. From his birth until now, Granui didn't know that he had no scent of his own. This means that throughout his life, he has been a nobody to everyone. He has no identity, no existence, and when he dies, no one will remember him. This realization has a great impact on him because for someone as greedy and ambitious as Granui, his greatest fear would be his own oblivion. This scene also highlights the greatest irony in the film, which is that a person born with an unnerving sense of smell is born without his own scent. While walking to town, Granui stops in his tracks as he smells the sweetest scent he has ever smelt in his whole life, even surpassing the scent he smelt from the woman with the plums. From almost a mile away, he can smell the intoxicating scent of the red-haired woman riding her carriage on the way to grass. Granui runs after the carriage and tracks down the scent to the estate of Antoine Richis, as he stalks his gardens, he quickly finds out that the scent is coming from Rashis's daughter, Laura. Bronwy starts working at Madame Arnulfi's shop, where he learns the art of enflorage under the strict supervision of a brute named Drouot, who also happens to be Madame Arnulfi's lover. The point of the whole process is to press the flowers into the animal fat before boiling them in a large glass container to extract their essence. Madame Arnulfi refers to it as killing the flowers in their sleep. Later that night, two workers named Lucien and Jian fool around in one of the barns. Lucien leaves, tired of Jian's teasing, and leaves her alone in the barn. As Jian looks for him, she comes face to face with Granui. She becomes his first test subject as he submerges her dead body into the glass container. After a few instances of almost getting caught, Granui realizes that boiling the body isn't enough to extract its scent. In the film, Laura represents Granui's literal and metaphorical 13th scent. She is one of his essence to dominate all. Just when he thought he would never smell such a sweet scent again, he comes across her. Laura becomes his primary drive to complete his collection of essences. Once he captures her scent, he will create the ultimate perfume for the world. To fulfill this ambition, Granui starts learning the art of enflorage under Madame Arnulfi. To him, he doesn't care if she is exploiting his talents, or that her lover is a brute towards him, as long as he has complete access to the tools, that's all that matters. His mistress's words about killing the flowers in their sleep also foreshadow Granui's intentions in the next scene. With Jian's death, Granui crosses over from obsession to murder. At this point, there is no turning back. Granui knows that if he needs to kill to complete his collection, so be it. Granui tries again, but this time with a prostitute named Natalie. As she undresses, Natalie's dog sits closely as Granui begins to cover her in animal fat. When he takes out a special knife to scrape off the fat, Natalie orders him to leave. 
Unfortunately, Granwi doesn't take no for an answer, so he hits her on the head before she could protest more. He continues the procedure and cuts off Natalie's hair before wrapping her entire body in animal fat in a piece of cloth. After a few hours, Granwi scrapes off the fat, runs it through the process, and extracts the scent. As he sniffs the single drop of essence, he knows that he has been successful. To further test his theory, he puts the scent on his wrist and is able to call Natalie's dog, thinking that he is its owner. He places Natalie's essence in a bottle and places it together with 12 other empty bottles. Granwi has finally learned the process of extracting the essence of a human being. In this scene, we can see just how ruthless Granwi can be. He doesn't even hesitate to strike Natalie in the head, and wastes no time extracting her scent. This gives us a first impression of how Granwi will treat his future victims. This success only encourages Granwi to sniff out exceptional scents among the people of Grass and add them to his collection. Meanwhile, at the Rishi's estate, Laura is celebrating her birthday together with their guest of honor, the Marquis de Montesquieu. Unbeknownst to them, Granwi is watching them as he hides in the shadows. The Marquis gives her an expensive necklace, and Laura feels overwhelmed as she accepts the gift. To break the awkward tension, Laura's twin friends, Albine and Francoise, suggest a game of hide-and-seek. Laura feels relieved to find an escape as she runs into the garden maze. She quickly finds a place to hide, but is disturbed to find a peculiar shadow running towards her. She turns around and escapes only to run into the Marquis. He tries to force himself on her, but they're interrupted when Granwi throws a rock, destroying a lamp above them. Laura takes her cue and abandons the Marquis. Rashis ends the game and is relieved to have his daughter back. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for Albine and Francoise who are missing. The guests organize a party to look for the twins, but they are long dead, covered in animal fat, and the second and third victims to fill Granwi's set of essences. As Granwi revels in his success, he accidentally drops a single essence on his hand just as Drew enters the room to berate him. Drew gets a whiff of the essence and suddenly calms down. He then politely asks Granwi to prepare the frames. Granwi, realizing the power of the scent, nods his head and leaves. Here, we see a glimpse of the relationship dynamic between Rashis and Laura. We learn that Laura's mother had died sometime before the film, and that this loss and grief had led Rashis to overcompensate for his daughter. This makes him become overprotective and controlling of his daughter's life, and even going as far as setting up her own marriage to the Marquis without taking her feelings into consideration. On the other hand, we can see that Laura is still very much like a child who's trying to gain her own independence. She clearly doesn't appreciate the puppet game her father is playing. On to the next vital scene. We are first introduced to the potent power of Granwi's crafted essence. Since the beginning of the film up to this point, the story has generally stayed on realistic terms. Although Granwi has an unnerving sense of smell, a person having a good nose is still possible in the real world. However, having a scent that can alter a person's state of mind is impossible and bordering on ridiculous. But in this film, it's very much part of the lore, and this particular scene hints at a bigger fantastical element to the film later on. The next morning, the townspeople find the twins' bodies floating in a river just outside of grass. The council immediately calls for a meeting and Rishi suggests a curfew until the killer is caught. The council doesn't hear his plea, fearing the town might go bankrupt. This is good news for Granwi, who in the next several weeks abducts and kills three more women. The council finally gives in to the curfew, but this doesn't stop him from taking his fourth and fifth victims. The council calls for a meeting again, and Rishi speculates that in order to capture the killer, they must know what the killer wants. He points out that all the women he abducted were of exceptional beauty, and they had their virginities intact. It's almost as if he was collecting them. The council dismisses his theories, and Granwi continues on with his plans. The killing turns the town of grass into a state of fear and paranoia. The townspeople board up their houses and turn on anyone who they think might be the killer. When Granwi takes his twelfth victim, the bishop holds a mass to try and excommunicate the killer whom they think is a demon. Just as he finishes his sermon, a messenger arrives and announces that they have captured the killer. A man in Grenoble has just confessed to the crimes. Meanwhile, the real killer, Granwi, sits in his workshop, mixing the twelve essences that he has collected and awaiting his thirteenth essence, the final scent to dominate all. Granwi is now on a murder spree, having killed twelve women in all. This is the fruit of his isolated and greedy upbringing. All his life, Granwi has been used by greedy people around him and discarded when he was no longer of use. To him, this is how relationships work, because that's how he has always been treated. By Madame Gaillard, Grimal, Baldini, Madame Arnoufi, and Drouot. And so, this is how he treats the women. Granwi is greedy in the sense that he abducts and kills these women because he wants something from them, which is their scent. Once he has captured that, they are no longer of use to him, so he discards them, just like how he dumped the twins in the river as if they were trash. Worst of all, Gran Wee shows no remorse because no other person has taught him about love, sympathy, much less knowing the difference between right and wrong. In the end, his ambition has turned him into a cold and ruthless killer, and he doesn't even know it. Despite the news, Rishis isn't convinced. The supposed killer confessed to ravaging his victims, but the women in grass were not violated. Feeling paranoid, Rishi scolds Laura for attending a festival while the killer is still on the loose. Laura runs away, almost falling into Granwi's hands. 
but she changes her mind just in time and finds her father. Later that night, Rashis wakes up from a nightmare and runs into his daughter's bedroom, only to find her bedroom window open, despite closing it the night before. At the crack of dawn, Rashis packs their things and heads north, hoping to outwit the killer. He takes Laura out of the carriage, and the two ride on horseback towards a different route from their entourage. When Granwi wakes up, he panics as he realizes that Laura's scent is getting weaker. He packs his things and runs after them. Despite Rashi's efforts, nothing can fool Granwi's nose, and so he takes the road, heading south. Meanwhile, Druo searches for Granwi and discovers the hair and clothing of the victims buried in one of the workshops. We understand that just like any father, Rashis knows that the killer is still out there, so he stays true to his protective instincts to make sure his daughter is safe. With his wife gone, Laura is the only thing he has worth living for, and if he loses her as well, he'll never be able to forgive himself. Unfortunately, his love isn't enough to keep her safe. In this scene, we can truly see the extent of Granwi's sense of smell. The fact that he can detect the fading smell of a scent that is miles away adds to the ridiculous and fantastical element of the film. Meanwhile, Rashis and Laura arrive at a remote seaside inn and buy out all the rooms for one night. At dinner, Rashis finally explains his frantic behavior. He tells Laura that he's written to the Marquis, accepting his marriage proposal on her behalf. And by tomorrow morning, they will be riding a boat to stay at a monastery until her wedding. Laura is enraged and walks out of the room in protest. Unbeknownst to them, Ron Wee has tracked them down to the inn. He sneaks into the stables and prepares the animal fat on the cloth. He then sneaks through the innkeeper's room, past the dog, and grabs the key from Rashis' room. As Granwi enters Laura's bedroom, he prepares himself to knock her out until she turns around and looks up at him. He hesitates for a moment, but he knows that he must complete his collection. When morning arrives, Rashis opens the door to her daughter's bedroom, only to find her bald, naked, and dead. Meanwhile, Granwi just finished extracting Laura's essence and has now added the last drops to complete the ultimate perfume. Suddenly, a group of soldiers surround him and arrest him, finally putting an end to his crimes. Rashis ultimately fails in protecting his daughter because he doesn't have the knowledge of what he is up against. If it was any other killer, his odds would have been far greater. But as this film has shown us, Granwi is an expert when it comes to tracking down scents. This time, Granwi's lack of scent also proves to be an asset. Since he has no scent and no sense of existence, the dog is unable to smell him and he passes through the innkeepers as if he were a ghost. Rashis underestimated his opponent's skills and that is what led to his defeat. Back in the present time, the whole town of Grass gathers in the square to watch Granwi's execution. As he sits in his cell, Granwi reveals the perfume that he's been hiding. He manages to place a drop of scent on him just as the guards drag him out. Meanwhile, the whole town is waiting for his arrival when a carriage gallops to the scaffold. Instead of being bound and chained, Granwi walks out in a fancy blue uniform. He had placed a few dabs of the perfume on himself using a handkerchief, and now every person who gets a whiff of the scent is suddenly placed in a state of bliss. He walks to the scaffold with his scent so powerful and intoxicating that the executioner declares him innocent on the spot. Realizing the power of the perfume, Granwi waves around the handkerchief he used earlier and lets the wind spread the scent around. The whole town of Grass slowly slips into a state of euphoria and bows down to Granwi, declaring him as an angel from heaven. People are screaming, crying, and declaring their love for him. Granwi lets his handkerchief go, and then, in the wildest turn of events, the whole town undresses before him and starts making love with the nearest person to them. If we weren't paying attention to the fantastical elements of the film, this scene would come up as a big surprise. But contrary to popular belief, this scene actually makes sense. Granwi's perfume is so powerful that it's able to transform a bloodthirsty crowd into a massive lovemaking festival. It's already been established that anyone who gets even a tiny whiff of Granwi's essence is swayed into a state of love and euphoria. This is ultimately how Granwi cheats death. Just like his ambition, his self-preservation has no limits. One can argue that the only thing that can defeat Granwi is Granwi himself. This is a thought we should keep as we move on to the end of the film. As Granwi watches the love fest, his mind returns to the woman with the plums. In his dreams, the woman is alive and kisses him, and they start to make love. A tear drops from Granwi's eye, for he knows that in reality, she is already dead. Rashis cries out as he approaches Granwi, stating that he will not fall for his act. But as soon as he steps into the scaffold, he gets a strong whiff of Granwi's scent and falls down to his knees to beg for his forgiveness. He even begs Granwi to become his son. The people of Grass wake up from the lovemaking and literally erase the ghastly experience from their memories. By the afternoon, Drouo is arrested since it was in his place where the victim's hairs were found. After 14 hours of torture, Drouo confesses and is executed. With that, the case is closed. There are three important points to discuss in this scene. Firstly, Drouo takes the fall for Granwi, making him the last indirect victim of Granwi's misfortune. The second point is that we can truly see the extent of the power of Granwi's perfume by observing Rishi's reaction to it. 
Rashiz was the only one who came face to face with Gran Wee on the scaffold, so we can only imagine how much of the scent he actually inhaled. As the film shows, the perfume is so powerful that it can turn Rashiz, whose daughter Gran Wee had just killed, into a sobbing man who begs him for forgiveness when he should be cursing him, or even killing him on the spot. Thirdly, and lastly, we should note Gran Wee's final realization, as he watches the people making love and being happy in front of him, he realizes that this is something that he has never felt or experienced before in his entire life. In this sense, Granwi is alone again, because he is alienated from these emotions being shown in front of him. Meanwhile, Granwi is already halfway back to Paris. In his hand, he has the invincible power to command the love of mankind. But instead, he chooses to go back to the place where he was born. He pours the whole perfume on him, and it instantly attracts a crowd of people. The scent is so powerful and intoxicating that the people start to literally devour him, and by the time they finished eating him, they leave with a feeling of bliss. When morning came, the only thing left of Granwi's existence was his clothes. In the end, the film concludes with a full circle. Granwi, having grown alone and isolated, has become like the people who brought him up. He mirrored their greed and ambition, and turned those traits into an obsession with collecting that will ultimately lead to murder. He used those women, and discarded them just like how the people in Granwi's life had taken advantage of him and tossed him over for the next one. Even though Granwi has fulfilled his ambition, he realized that he's just back at where he started, and that he is alone in life. Now that he has completed what he wanted to do, there's nothing else for him. He has no purpose, and because he has no scent, he has no existence. Despite having that amount of power in his hand, it will still not make him happy, because there was only one thing the perfume could not do. It could not turn him into a person who could love, and be loved by everyone else. And so, Granwi returns to the most repugnant place in Paris, back to the place where he was born. And it is in this same place where he voluntarily ends his life, thus completing the circle of this fantastical film. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.